Good afternoon, and I believe it's time for me to talk here, so forgive me if I'm a little bit new to this. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us here, and especially for, I think, it was probably a weird session called What If I Were King? So if you'll allow me, my name's Chris Skaggs. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of Soma Games, and uh, we're here in beautiful downtown Newburgh, Oregon, so uh, not too far from CGGC's home base. And, uh, and I wanted to share some thoughts with you today that I've been wrestling with and really thinking about for about the last couple of years. So I'm going to sh share my screen. I'm going to go from there. And here's where I'd like to start. Um, let me start with this weird question. It's like, what if I were king and where that came about? As long story short is a this was a question that God asked me uh, about two years ago, and I've been chewing on it ever since. Let me see where this started. If you don't know, uh, I'm going to just give you an example of Elon Musk. And whatever you might think about Elon Musk, you'll see that he's doing all of these strange, so seemingly strange things. He's building electric cars. He's building electric walls. He's building machines that bore into the ground and satellites and spaceships and flamethrowers and all of this stuff. And at one point, I remember the time in my life, this is probably two, three years ago, where something that was actually probably obvious to some people had not been obvious to me and that it all had a purpose. It all had a goal and that it, it was as if at some point in the past, Elon Musk just decided that he was the king of Mars. He had just decided that he had a charter to colonize, to terraform, to change the profound history of the human race and colonize Mars. And from that point, he basically just started working backwards from if this was my goal, what do I need to do from there? And all of a sudden, for me, all of these things snapped into awareness of what he's actually trying to do all makes sense. I need electricity on Mars because I'm not going to have fuel. I need everything that can run from the sun and solar power. I need to be able to dig under the grounds to protect myself from the radiation. I, I need flamethrowers because it's a possible, it's a portable source of energy. I need all of this to work together. I need global satellites so that I can have internet so that people on Mars can communicate with each other because we don't have time to build infrastructure. All of a sudden, it all made sense. And you have to ask yourself, wow, that's, that's really something. But what made you think this? Like, what in the world got this on your mind? And then that brought me to probably a couple other thoughts that were happening at the same time. There's a, there's a verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 where it says, The day is coming when the world is going to stand before a jury made up of the followers of Jesus. Now, if someday you're going to rule on the world's fate, would it be a good idea to at least practice some of these smaller cases? Why, we're even going to judge angels. That's the message translation, by the way, um, in case you hadn't heard it. And I want you to keep in mind that when, uh, when the Bible here uses the word judge, probably a better word for us to understand it is govern. It's less talking about like you were good, you were bad. It's more talking about how do you manage the celestial kingdom? And I got, I got to keep in mind that this doesn't just show up in 1 Corinthians. It shows up in lots of places. For example, in Luke 19, 17, Jesus says, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you will now have authority over 10 cities. Okay, he's not talking about whatever the metaphor is. He's not talking about just having, I don't know, money or power or something like this, but he's talking about the governance of a political institution, a city, a nation, a town. These are things that are seen in the terms of governance. And this happens all throughout the Bible. In fact, at the very beginning of the Bible, you see Adam and Eve made with, uh, made with fantastic gifts and glory and power. The whole world is given over to them like a wedding gift on the day. It's just still the dew dripping on it. And the first thing God says is rule, reign it, right? Like you guys manage this thing. This is a gift to you. And keep in mind that at that point, there was the whole world, which was wild and crazy and full of unknown things. And not just, not just that the land hadn't been discovered, but this was a world that had never had any art. That it never had any architecture, any music. No one had discovered anything. And Adam and Eve were given this opportunity to govern in that situation. Now, of course, all of the next 
many chapters and books is where that kind of went sideways. But you see this bookend all the way up in Revelation 20, 21, 22 also, is when all things are made new, there's a giant game reset rule. It's all fixed. Your bodies are saved. You've been delivered from sin. The devil is bound. All of that junk that's in the middle, all of the glory and all the pain and all the suffering and all of that mixed together, it's all sorted when we get to the end of Revelation. And the next thing is, okay, try again and govern. Now, I don't know about you, but I had never heard a single sermon, a single class. I don't even know that I've ever read a single book or found a book that talks about how do we govern in the way of heaven? Like, how does that even come to think about it? So it's all over the place. It's just that I hadn't ever really had an opportunity. But when I started thinking about, especially this verse, uh, this line in the in the message, wouldn't it be a good idea to practice? The truth is, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I, I literally, is there a book, How to Be a King? If maybe, maybe old, you know, Edwards and Harry, maybe they've maybe read these. I've never seen it. But the thing is, that concept led me to a lot of other little things. It made me think in ways and about topics and the subjects that were really in the back of my, my mind, to be honest. It's not like something I can do every day, but it really made me think. And it made me start finding people and ideas, who uh, people who had the same kind of thoughts, who were interested in the same thoughts. One of the big ideas that came to me is the idea of building a house, um, it seems to me that in biblical terminology, we see this first and foremost in the notion of like, we will be a house of prayer. In this regard, he's talking partly not just of a place, not just of a, a building for you can go together and pray, but at a place like the Sanhedrin, where a body of people come together with governance and judgment and kindness all on their mind, that they're willing to engage and wrestle with these questions of wisdom and power and authority, and they want to take it seriously. Now, let me be clear. I am totally comfortable, I'm totally com uh, aware of the fact that in Christian circles, things like power and authority are not normal topics. In fact, I think it's something that we, for most of us, I'm, I'm sure there are exceptions. For most of us, it's just not a thing that we typically talk about. For one thing, any one of you, I'm sure, can finish the subject, can finish the line, Power corrupts and absolute power does this other thing. And so we we find ourselves, I think for, for most mere mortals, thinking that power and authority are kind of dangerous, that there's so, so many uh, stories of abuse and mishandling of power and authority that many of us just don't want any piece of it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to have it. And we certainly don't want to judge angels. But let me ask you a question. If we see an arsonist who is burning a house down, and he's throwing uh, gasoline all over the place and he's torching your house, we're understandably upset by the situation. Here's a person who's breaking the law. He's breaking the rules of good, uh, good society. He's clearly doing something wrong. But imagine that as you're watching this arsonist do his thing, that there is also uh, a fire brigade outside the house with everything they need. They've got the, they've got the, the truck, they've got the water, they've got the people and the ladders. Over here are the policemen who've got all the things and all of our simply standing by as the arsonist goes about his business. And you ask yourself, who are you more upset with? Who, who bothers? What, which of those people is doing something more wrong? Now, I don't know if, about you, but for me, it's, it's the authority. It's the people who have the opportunity to do something about it and aren't that upsets me the most. Proverbs says it this way, if you have the power to do good for someone and you don't, you're screwing up. That's my translation. And let me go a little bit farther. There's a difference between power and authority. Uh, I think the easiest way to see this is in a police officer. A police officer has a gun and a badge. The gun is representative of their power. They can get stuff done. And the threat of mortal violence is there. Lord willing, it's not necessary, but it's available. The gun represents that ability to use power, but it's their badge that represents their authority. They don't just have the power to do a thing. They also have the ability and the support and the authority based on powers above them so that when they use power, it's not willy nilly. Because of course I can have a gun and no badge and that doesn't make me good. I can have a badge and no gun and I can't get anything done. 
And so these two things go together in, in all of our normal expectations. When the Bible talks mostly about believers, most of the time, not exclusively, most of the time it talks about our authority as compared to our power. And so let me go back to this question of, uh, of the arsonist and the fireman standing by. If we also know that the reason that those firemen are standing by is because the mayor has ordered them to do so, that he has the authority to make these decisions. And it was his decision not to intervene and to let the arsonist do what he was. Now, who's the bigger villain? See, here's the trick about power and authority is that if it's not used by good people, you're sure that it will be used by bad. And it's one of the tensions that we deal with in the Bible is this ability, how can I be first by being last? How can I serve and lead at the same time? This is, this is not an easy question. I don't pretend it is. But I do know that it's been on my heart a lot that if we, if we always walk away and shun the power, then we're probably leaving it to people who ought not to have it. So when I think about that, I started thinking uh, about what that might do in my life. This brings me back to 2020, um, where in the middle of the Rona, there's, uh, there's, of course, all kinds of shenanigans going on. And I find myself, like most of us, basically sidelined. There's, there's not a lot I can do. I can't go anywhere. Air, travel shut down. Most of my work shut down. So we're just stalling. And it was in the middle of, of those first few months that God asked me this weird question. He said, what if you were the king of the games industry? Like, what would you do? What would you even want to do? What would you consider as a goal? And, and I just want you to think about it. Now, to be really clear, it came with a couple caveats. It was, there was no magic wand, no, you know, genie three wishes stuff. It wasn't just that I could say poof and it was changed. The notion is, was if all I had was authority and favor, what would I do with it? What would I start? Where would I even want to go? And the uh, truth is I had no idea whatsoever. Not only was I wrestling with sort of broad, generic questions of power and authority and ruling and reigning, like I'm just trying to figure out what this all means. Now God brings it someplace very specific. Like he gives me a question about the job that I have chosen, about the field I've chosen I got into, and he makes it much more practical, much more uh, tangible in the story. And it brought me to a whole world of different questions that were far more far more grapplable, although also they seem to have implications I wasn't ready for. For example, what even is a kingdom? This is language that for me, I don't ever talk about kingdoms. If anything, I talk about, like it's a joke to me, right? At least in modern worlds. As, a, as an American, we have this, this like long tradition of rejecting monarchies, period. So even the notion of a king seems like, it seems this silly thing. I'm watching Downton Abbey and partly the whole role, the whole story is about the collapse, the slow collapse of the aristocracy and thinking like this, that feels so old, so antiquated to me. Like, why does it even matter? And yet this is the language that I find in the Bible. And I don't think it's just because the Bible was written a long time ago. Like, I believe that this is partly how heaven operates and it is very foreign to me. If I don't even know what a kingdom is, you have other questions like what, how is a kingdom measured? What are the KPIs for a kingdom? What, what do you decide? Like, this is a good kingdom, that's a bad kingdom. And how does that compare, for example, to how we measure a business or a ministry? I will tell you that I believe that they're very, very different. To answer one question, I think a kingdom at some level is mostly defined by people. A kingdom without people is nothing. It's the citizens. It's the, it's the, the people who call themselves by that name. That makes a kingdom. And that the easiest, surest way to measure a kingdom is by the thriving of those people. Are they economically okay? Are they, are they physically okay? Are they emotionally, spiritually growing? It's the thriving of those people. I think that is central to this question of kingdoms, which frankly is not how you measure a business. A lot of people will, will say that the, the single fiduciary responsibility of a business is to make a profit. And I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just a different measure. And it's a different way to approach what we do next. If I don't know how a company is, me or how a kingdom is measured, I also have to ask, like, what does a kingdom do? What's different about a kingdom from a, from a business or a, or a ministry? And again, I go back to people and I think, well, a, a kingdom seems to be a collection 
of individuals who have a whole variety of strengths and values and purposes. Some are good at that, some are good at this. And it's that collective building of value, not just inside the kingdom, but as it exports. A kingdom has imports and exports. It has the things that it brings to the world, the things that it offers to its people. This idea of like, what is the activity of the people? And it may or may not have any singular goal to it. I think France is known for certain things, right? So I associate it with food and with uh, with sort of like culture and art and this kind of stuff, but it is also associated sometimes with decadence. So these are things that a kingdom might be different from a company. So I started to wonder about what this all means. And then also like how do kingdoms interact with one another? What is the role of diplomacy, which is something that I don't think businesses or ministries typically think about. We might imagine partnerships, but not diplomacy. It's a very different and subtly important thing. But I'll tell you a couple of thoughts that I have started to gather around this, the, this idea is that a kingdom has borders, which is to say it has its sphere of authority and beyond which that's not its thing. Now, at first, I don't know about you, but when I think about prayer and things like that, I am not generally imagining the boundaries of my prayer. And yet Paul is clear that we need to know the sphere of our authority and stay within it which was another verse I just had never considered. And yet it speaks to this question of kingdom and governance. A kingdom also has laws, which is funny too, to have God sort of point out, you know, the kingdom of God isn't just chaos and anarchy. It's not just fun as if there's, you know, everyone's sort of around and they have this big party, which is obviously part of the scripture, but it's not all of it. It's not that we all just sit around and, and party forever. The kingdom of God has rules, it has laws, and those laws codify its values and its structure. Speaking of that, a kingdom has a culture. It has, it has the things that it celebrates and the things that it avoids. And the culture becomes perhaps one of the most defining characteristics of any of the ways that we understand kingdoms or nations or tribes is that we understand is like, what do they represent? What do they embody as a culture? And that's how you might say that Americans are different than than English and English are different from French and French are different from Russians. A big part of why we say that and how we understand it is this question of culture. So what would be the culture of the kingdom of heaven and how could we put words to it? And lastly, of course, there's a thousand things, but lastly, I realized how much a kingdom is not just a thing. It is an existence thing. It is an existence throughout a period of time. Kingdoms have beginnings. They have histories. They have the founders. They have their, their heroes, their traditions, their folklores, and they progress over time. They're never static. A kingdom isn't just a point in space. It's not just a point on a map. It is a life that stretches on through at least years, usually centuries, sometimes millennium, and it changes and shifts over time. But the one thing it is not is static. Now, as I was chewing on this, I have to realize this is not actually such a weird idea. Um, as I mentioned, we have the first Corinthians verse. Uh, don't you know, in another translation, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Don't you know that the saints are going to judge the world? It's right there in front of me. I have this idea that you are kings and priests. Now, unless we're not kings and queens of something, then it's just a weird language to imagine. So what actually does it mean to be a king and a queen of something? And I realized that all God was really doing with this question for me was helping me take something that had been right in front of my face all along, seriously and specifically. And what that brought me to is that, you remember Elon back at the beginning, that crazy old South African. This, in the last two years, has become my Mars. This has become the animating question in my heart. And I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how long it's going to chew on it. But I can't remember a time in my life where a single idea has consumed me in a good way. <laughs> for so long and so completely. This is on my mind a lot. And it's made me want to start thinking through things like what would I want to see a hundred years from now in our games industry? If I, had to, if I were to describe the future that I would want, I wanna start really imagining that. And then I wanna start reverse engineering that reality from now with the little decisions that become foundations, that become patterns, that become traditions. I want to start thinking about that. I want to start founding a house that will lay the foundations between this world and heaven so that when we look in 100 years, we can ask this question of like, what would the arts and entertainment sphere look like to those folks who come behind us? 
And so this becomes my Mars and it's what has kept me up and why I, make, why I keep having this conversation with other people. And just to be clear, I'm imagining the whole of arts and entertainment, the whole of, <laughs> of gaming, not merely those games that are made by Christians for Christians. Because I think another thing that a kingdom has to be is it has to be inclusive. It has to make sure that it's not just a, a backwater, that it's not just a village. A kingdom has to include a multiplicity of thoughts and ideas, and that can't be limited just to Christian games, though it can be led by Christian leaders, I think. This has also led me to take practical steps, at least to try to start something. So at Soma Games, as an example, we try to make our corporate culture really imbibe this kind of thing. And so it starts with the simplest things, which is like, can we have a work schedule that deliberately includes rest, that includes Sabbath, that includes prayer and discipleship, not just like on the sidebar, like these are available, but these are rooted and embedded into our culture on a daily, weekly basis. So as a little example, and I'm just trying to say like every morning we start off with five minutes of basically contemplation centering prayer before our scrum every morning. It's, we're just going to, we're just going to center our hearts and set that before Christ. It's a little thing, but we've made it part of our corporate culture. Every Wednesday we do what we call Jesus time, which is a, which is the morning is set apart for basically discipleship and learning and spiritual formation. It's on the clock. It's part of our schedule. It's part of how we set our tone for the company. There's lots of other little things. We also started a podcast to start sharing some of these thoughts with anyone who's paying attention. And, uh, and I don't expect that we have all the answers, but we just wanted to share our thought process with anyone who cared to engage. Looking outward, we wanted to start building some community. Just again, raise the flag, see who's interested. So we started Imladris, which was our, our small little conference designed for the few people who we knew were both, were both uh, moving along seriously in their professional game development uh, question and also moving along seriously in their spiritual development. So we bring these people together as we can just to chew on these questions and to find fellowship of like-minded believers. And then we also started a game dev fund, which was if we really want to see Christian developers uh, move in the space, then they need help. They need every, every chance they can get. So we started a little fund uh, to give Christian developers like folks at CGDC, a little bit of help. Maybe $5,000 could change your life. Maybe maybe you need 20. These are not meant to like fund your big AAA monster, but they are meant to help people get a little bit farther down the process uh, and see if that tests their waters. Now, look, these are not things that I'm trying to tout. I'm just saying like we try to be practical. It's not enough just to think the big thoughts. You have to bring it down into reality. Like James says, you can't be that person who says, go and be well fed, but then locks the door on the person who's hungry. It has to mean something in practice. But here's the thing. I can't do this alone, and I wouldn't even want to try. See, the goal that I have here is to bring together a few big ideas that I think I want to ask your help with. One is, are you feeling in any of this that, that it is stirring in your heart? Does this idea of governing, of, of leading, of creating and forming the game development world for the next hundred years. Does any of that ring for you? And the truth is it won't ring for everybody. Is this a, is this a, a process, is a thought that you'd want to be a part of? Well, let me encourage you. You're already at CGDC. And so at the very least, you have found community that has these goals in common. So congratulations, you've already taken the first step. I would argue the next step is that if you're called, is bring this up with your team, bring this up with your family. See, is this something that you want to lean into more? Um, are you called simply to engage with the community at a friend and advocacy level, or are you asked to go deeper? I won't know, only you would know the difference. But if you do, seek that professional development so you're weak, working on your chop, your skills, so that your portfolio looks better and better. Like Make that something you do intentionally. And same thing with your spiritual goals. It's not enough to have great mad skills if you wind up falling apart spiritually when you are tested. Because let's be clear, like we're walking into an industry out there that often doesn't want us. So we have to be prepared, we have to be strong, we have to be shrewd. So I'd encourage you seek for that. Now I would also say like, here's a goal that we have as just a way to start with something. It's been said by Lauren Cunningham in his book, the, uh, the, the Book That Transforms Nations. Great, great book, by the way, if you haven't read it. He says that when the gospel is present in about 10% of a culture, 
then it becomes self-sustaining. Then it can, then you've got a community that stays together, that can stick together, that can support one another. Now, what if we made it a goal to find or recruit or feed or, or whatever it is, just collect five or 10% of the game industry? I don't know if you know this, but the whole game industry is estimated to be about five to 50,000 to 60,000 people. That's the whole thing, which means 10% of that is only one urban church. 5,000 people is not a big number in the grand scheme of things, but that is our goal is to bring together right now, that's our next goal, I should say, is to bring together 5,000 people who are both solidly Christian and professionally working in industry. When we have that 10%, we'll have accomplished something that I think is, is a difficult goal, but I think an achievable one. And I think it's one we can put numbers to and actually know if we're making progress. Of course, beyond that, so where Lauren says is the 20%. And when the 20% thing is, that 20% of culture is reached, he says that that's when a whole culture starts to pivot. It goes from an embattled bunch of Christians who are sort of fighting against the tides of their own culture to a bunch of Christians who are empowered to start to lead and change the tides of their culture. And what if we could do that? What if we could be the voices of the next hundred years for game development and we could speak towards all the things that could be done, that should be done? That would be a different world. So here's the invitation. I hope that in all this, for those of you who are called, that you hear something that inspires you, something that, that, that brings you like perhaps a focus and a purpose for what maybe you have thought God called you into gaming, but you didn't really know why. You thought this was about that I love Jesus and I love gaming and I guess I'll put those together, but maybe there's something much deeper that he's calling you into. Maybe it's to be one of those people to whom Jesus says, well done, here's 10 cities, like knock yourself out. I want you to encourage you, if that's you, I want you to think in two ways that are important. Whatever we're talking about, however we understand this question of what if we were king, it's like it has to be spiritual. It has to be spiritual. It cannot be merely practical. It cannot be simply business. It cannot just be to fix the things that we think are broken. It has to be starting from a foundation that is God and God alone. We cannot simply repair or reimagine what the world has already done because those, were, those systems were made without Christ's input. So I want you to think spiritually. I invite you to think in an entirely different foundation. And I also want to encourage you to think mythically, which is the practicality has to follow the reason. Your why is far more important than your how. We have to figure out like where we're going before we figure out how to get there. And this is the work of the moment. This world of game development is very different than the world of movies in that the game space is not fully formed. It's not the machine that, for example, Hollywood is. It's still changing. It's still shifting. There's still a lot to be said and done. So think mythically about the hows after you think about the whys. Think also about what could be, not just about what is. And think with joy in your heart, which is to say, think about what could be and not only what should be finger wagging, sort of complaining, making, making all the things that we wish were different about the current space only goes so far. Those, those observations could be real, but in the end, they won't satisfy if we don't have a de better answer. So in that, I hope that you will ask this question that God asked me, not just as what if I were king, but what if you were king? What if you were the queen of the game industry what would you do? What would you want? How would you govern? And see where God goes with that. So that's my presentation for today. And, uh, and I hope you found it interesting. I'm going to close my note here and stop sharing my screen. Did it do it already? It stopped sharing my screen already somehow. So thank you very much. And uh, I think we go into a QA and a now says here, can you speak a little bit more about the Game Dev Fund and other ongoing initiatives? Yeah, sure. So um, in fact, I'll, I'm pretty sure I can uh, throw up a link here in a minute. So long story short is about a year ago, we started, we just kind of on the back of our uh, napkin had this idea like, what if we were a nonprofit? 
what if we just had a way for people to make tax deductible donations specifically with the purpose of um, feeding in to uh, to Christian game developers let me just see if I can find the link here yep I found it stand by and I'll paste it in the Michael where's my chat speaker chat over here so that's our game dev fund. And what you'll see is last year we thought, I wonder if I can raise $25,000. And uh, and the truth is like, we were really excited. We did, Truth, long story short, it, it, it funded. And so I think that the text you'll see right now is actually from last year's text. We're currently rewriting this year's text and we wanna give it, uh, we wanna raise $100,000. And what our intention is, is to give a series of what we call seeds to projects that, that frankly have to come and there's gonna be some kind of vetting process of like, we're going to try to select this one, that one. It's much more about the developer than it is about the project. So it's not so much, hey, I think this is a great game. It's that we're looking for, like, who's going to change the world? And if that's you, then we, we've got these little seed funds that might help you. Because I know how sometimes it's, if you just have, like, one or two people, what you really just need is time. I need to have a moment where I can focus on bringing my game to the next level. And so that's that's where we would we would say, like, if you won want to see more Christian developers get those games, I would encourage you to make a donation. It's tax deductible and all that is really great. And our goal is $100,000 this year. Um, even though right now the uh, the game dev, sort of the uh, the little bar, the the, the thermometer, it, it shows that we've completed it. It all goes to the right place and you'll see it uh, reflected as, as soon as we update that page. So, so thank you for that. Um, do you have specific tools or processes like Elon Musk trying to colonize Mars? that you believe need to be built. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Good to see your name here. So as we did our first Imladris um, uh, conference last year, one of the things that we became really aware of is this notion of infrastructure. And if, you, uh, if you've been watching The Chosen, there's this scene in, in the first season where uh, the bald Roman guy, whose name I forget, he's asking Matthew, he wants to show off, basically he wants to, to toot his horn to his rival and he asks Matthew how to do it. And Matthew says, you need to show them infrastructure projects because infrastructure implies a way of life, not just military power. Quintus, yes, thank you. Um, and that really got me thinking. Infrastructure to me are the totally boring, non-sexy things like roads and pipes and wires that no one really wants to take credit for that stuff for the most part, but they make everybody's life better. They make everybody's functions go smoother, I can get farther in less time with less money. And so what would infrastructure projects look like for Christian game developers? And that could be things like engines, that could be things like funding, that could be things like communication, that could be things like support structures for testing and QA. And so we started building several of those. And so uh, one thing that we were really happy with was we built our own kind of QA testing service that uh, we first used on our games. And, uh, and I'm happy to say our first outside project is now being wrapped, uh, being worked right now with Shara and, uh, and Closer Than You Know. We want to see, is this a thing that will be helpful to other Christian game developers? And I think that they will. So I think that's one way to, to answer that question. Thank you, Joel. In order to unite 10% of the industry as Christians, where and how do we start? Caleb, thank you. You know, Caleb, I got, you, your, your guess right now is as good as mine. But I will tell you, I think CGDC becomes the entry door. I, I, uh, as I was thinking more and more, like, what's the big picture here? CGDC has been such a great way to open up the door to anyone who wants to come. And uh, and it's it's a way to see, like, folks kind of dip their toes in, and then they can get more and more involved, engaged, more and more involved. And pretty soon, instead of uh, instead of just having, feeling isolated, they know that they're part of a community. In fact, if there was anything that it seems to be the universal experience with CGTC is this, oh my God, I thought I was alone. And I'm not, I'm not even alone. Like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Like that I think is where it starts. But I think the next question is, in order to find those 5,000 people, if I'm totally candid, we have to find those people who want to go deeper. We have, and and that, that's not everybody, right? The, uh, the notion is, is or and sometimes it's just not everybody just yet. Um, so, I think the next step is to understand like, well, what does deeper look like? And that's why I suggested some more professional development leads to that one thing. It's like, these are game developers, not merely uh, folks who kind of like games. And so that would be important. And then I think we want that notion of like, these people are hungry, people who really want to know God and, and you know, and are ready for that and not, you know, that takes time. That takes time for people. 
So that would be my suggestion on where to start. Um, we are actually working about a really weird idea of like, could we gamify something like that? So people would have a sense of like, I'm part of the club. I don't know. And so it's just an idea we're playing with. I don't know where it will go. Uh, kind says, how can I go about rallying Christian game devs and designer in my local area? You know, I, that's a great question. I, I love that. Um, it makes it really practical, makes it really local. So I want to suggest just a couple ideas, but the truth is we need way more ideas. So I'll try to start something, but I, I'm not prepared to say I've thought about this a lot, but I do think community is, is best done face to face and any kind of game jam, any kind of, of little tiny place to get people together just to share life, I think builds that heart. And so what happens is that if you create any kind of a flag that says, I'm doing a game, a game jam for Christians, um, and we're going to do it, whatever, at the library twice a week or twice a month or whatever it is, it will start probably slow. Uh, but you can probably easily go reach out to local churches just to say, who's on this page? And pretty soon, if you've got 10 people, that's all you need. 10 people is what, you know, 12 people, I guess, is all Jesus had to, like, turn the world upside down. Like, it doesn't take thousands of people. It takes 12. 12 people turns the world around. And if you can just bring those people and, and, uh, and just give them simply a reason to collaborate, you're going to really change the world. So, kind of, I love that, that thought. And it's doable everywhere. Anyone can start a game jam um, at the local library anywhere they want. So it's one idea. I'm sure there are better ones. This comes from Felipe. When doing a backtracking exercise, what do you envision as one of the most important steps that need to happen to make a Christian game development thrive? Um, ownership. If I were to pick one profound problem that I don't know how to solve, it's this question of ownership. And I think this is true of the entire sphere of arts and entertainment. Let me say it this way. So long as the sphere of arts and entertainment, gaming included, so long as it is dependent and doesn't own the rights to its own production and it's the fruit of its own labor, then to use a different metaphor, we are simply serfs farming someone else's land. We will never be able to make our own decisions. And so I think one of the things that happens right now, and you can see this in Hollywood, for example, is we sense, I think, in our hearts that too many of the decisions in Hollywood are not made by creatives, they're made by business people. And I'm going to be clear, nothing wrong with business people. I just think that the sphere of arts and entertainment needs to control the, the, the fruit of its own labor if it's ever going to lead itself. Ownership also allows for us to create the culture and the values and the purpose so that we're not always just answering to someone else's purpose. We're not always just trying to make sure that we're making a buck or, or, uh, or, or, uh, you know, optimizing monetization on, you know, seven day retention rates. There was a fellow who recently took a job at Netflix and, and uh, one of the comments that he made in his LinkedIn post was something along the lines of, I'm so excited to start working on games that don't have to focus solely on click rates. And you could hear, you could hear in his voice this frustration that he had lived with for who knows how long to, to just not make games that were fun not make games that, I don't know, God forbid, had a good story, but just make games that retained people for ads, which is a place where that is not the heart of creativity. That's not the heart of arts and entertainment. That's the heart of business. And again, I don't want to say this in a nasty way. Like We need business people. But within the sphere of Christian gaming, I think that we need to own our own work. Um, I think that IP needs to revert to people who created it in the way that the Jubilee did. In the Jubilee, it was this notion that all the land had already been divided by tribe, uh, by God. So like this land is Benjamin, this land is Levi, etc. Levi is a bad example. Um, and that every 50 years, that all reverted. So no matter who had sold something or traded something or was a debt to something else, it was all canceled. All the debt was canceled, all the land went back. If we did that with IP, that after a certain amount of time, it always reverted back to the, to the original creator, that would be an interesting thought. Then at least even if that creator has passed away, their family enjoys at least at least the ownership. Now they can go right around and sell it again. But what if what if ownership of IP always, always, always rested with the creator? And it it could be leased, it could be borrowed, it could be, it could be that kind of stuff, but it could never be changed. That would be an interesting thought. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's I think the most profound problem that I'm dealing with. I just don't know how to solve it. And it, it's a, that's a big issue. But you asked a question. So <laughs> there you go. 
Anything else? Well, I think Michael suggested to me, in fact, I, he's over here, that uh, we want to go, we want to start wrapping this up. And so one, I want to say something about CGDC that I, that I hope you all feel is I started going to CGDC in 2005. And, uh, and for me, it came in this really random moment. I had no idea that there even were Christian games. Like it was all very new to me, but I was profoundly blessed with this notion that I mentioned earlier, like, oh my God, I'm not alone. And CGDC has always been this thing in my life that kept me grounded and, and aware that I am part of a much bigger community. And that is a huge blessing. So I'm honored to be able to, to come and speak and share just the thoughts that are on my mind, uh, the things that we are, that we're, that we're working out here in SOMA. And uh, I'm very grateful for your time. So thank you very much. And uh, may the conference continue. <laughs>